the part of this afternoon's meeting, I will serve as the staff facilitator. Um, thank you to everybody else who's attending Team PISO's presentation, which would include family members and friends, some of our current gemstone students, particularly freshmen, who are getting their first glimpse of what their future is going to look like uh, three years from now. Um, and everybody else, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're very proud of all of our senior teams. They've been preparing for this moment for a long time and have gone through a lot of trials and tribulations and adaptations as research work generally has you do. Uh, Team PISO, we want to take just a second and recognize your accomplishments and we want to celebrate all the effort and hard work that you've put in. We're very much looking forward to your presentation. Before I have you start, I'd like to take a second to formally introduce and thank the team's mentor, Mr. Rick Blanton who's been a friend of mine for a number of years, Director of Technical Operations with Terrapin Works, which really doesn't do justice to all, the, all of the roles that he plays for the Clark School of Engineering. And our librarian, Ms. Navenka, who usually understands when we don't try to pronounce her last name, um, in the interest of not butchering it. Um, I'd also like to thank the team's discussants. So this is our panel of experts who are, um, they're in the team's area of expertise. And in addition to maybe asking some questions during the public Q&A, they're also gonna have that private Q&A session with them um, after the public part to really give them some detailed feedback, which will be greatly appreciated and really help guide the, their progress towards their final thesis. Um, the meeting is being recorded, uh, as are the private and public chats. The team's going to have about 25 minutes to give their presentation, followed by the Q&A for the public session. Um, questions can come out loud if you prefer. You can also raise them in the chat, and I and the team members will be listening and monitoring the chat for your questions. Um, and at about the 45 minute mark, uh, we'll thank everybody who's here. And then I'm gonna send the team and their discussants off to a private breakout room so they can finish up their lengthier discussion. Um, and with that, if there aren't any other questions about how to get started, hi Mel, welcome. Um, if there aren't any questions, I'm gonna turn it over to the team Please uh, unmute yourself as you're ready to go and share your screen and uh, introduce yourselves and go ahead and get started. Beautiful. Can you hear us all right? Yes, thank you. Just a second. You want this to be us? Okay. Now we're ready. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming to our presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking about our investigation into the effects of curved cantilever, geome uh, cantilever geometry on piezoelectric power output um, presented by Team Piso. My name is Liam McCarthy. Um, I'm joined here by the other members of my team, uh, Ian Brady, Michaela Isuke, uh, Katharina Sampson, Rithik Sebastian, Mark Ventileski, and Santali Adab. Uh, so we'll be walking ourselves. Uh, we'll be walking through the uh, the general outline of our thesis, starting with our literature review, our methodology, our results, our analysis, and our discussion. And at the end, we will open ourselves to an audience uh, Q and A. Um, so, uh, for an introduction, recent years have brought a steadily growing demand for new sources of renewable energy, uh, both in order to combat the continual rise of global warming, as demonstrated by the graphs uh, shown here and to save the global hunger for electrical power in an increasingly modernized society. Current solutions uh, for, to renewable energy, while massive improvements to their fossil fuel predecessors, still come with significant drawbacks. The production and disposal for solar and wind power generators 
create environmentally hazardous byproducts, and the cost of such installations, while steadily de uh, decreasing, is still sizable. Thus, our research aims to contribute to the development of research and technology in this field uh, by investigating a new source of renewable energy applicable in a niche of low power, low cost scenarios. Uh, this is a piezoelectricity. And I will now uh, give it off to Kat to explain what exactly that is. So let's provide some context and define what is piezoelectricity or piezoelectricity. So the piezoelectric effect is a material's ability to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy or vice versa. When material with this property experiences stress or strain, an electrical charge is created, which can then be collected. This happens in materials without symmetry in the crystalline structure. A molecule of a piezoelectric material is shown here. On the left, the molecule is undisturbed and therefore neutral, neutral because the dipoles cancel each other out. Due to the crystalline asymmetric uh, structure of the material, there is space for the molecule to flex and become distorted with applied pressure so that the dipoles are shifted and there's an overall net charge. This property is found in a variety of materials categorized into four main types. Single crystals, like quartz, quartz have the best voltage output but are very expensive. Ceramics have great electrical properties and flexibility. One we will focus on is PZT, or lead zirconate titanate. They have a higher, high power output and are easy to manufacture. However, due to their fragility, they aren't used for cyclical loads. Another downside to these is that they perform the best when they're produced with lead, which creates lead-based byproducts during manufacturing. Research, however, is actively being done to find ceramics made without lead in order to be more environmentally safe. Composites and polymer forms combine ceramics or, material, or crystals with other materials in an attempt to better their performance and make them more durable. So, as mentioned before, the piezoelectric effect works in two directions. The inverse effect is when a charge is run through the material and the physical shape of the material is affected. This property is utilized in tasks that require precision, with examples like atomic force microscopes, machine tools, actuators, and damping mechanisms. On the other hand, the direct effect is when an applied force affects the structure of the material and a charge is generated, as explained in the diagram on the previous slide. This effect with respect to power generation is relatively underused and under-researched in comparison to the inverse effect, as research tends to focus on more consistent technology like solar and wind power instead. The idea has been theoretically applied to surfaces that would receive a lot of pressure and deformation like roads and railways. We decided to focus on its utilization in four tiles, specifically taking advantage of pedestrian and foot traffic. This has been conceptualized, but not widely marketed, again to, due to the greater success in energy production of other methods and its lack of exploitation. Thus, research like ours aims to find ways to optimize the power generations of these uh, unique materials in the context of floor tiles. Now on to Sanjay to talk more about power generation and batteries. Okay, so um, our project uses various piezoelectric equations to make important calculations. Here are some equations encountered in the research that were valuable to construct models and perform experiments. We have equations to measure the strain, electrical displacement, charge, and magnetic induction of a piezoelectric material. So the energy generated from piezoelectric, uh, piezoelectric tiles depends significantly on foot pressure distribution while walking, duration of pedestrian traffic, um, shape of the tile, energy harvester model, and shape of the cantilever. So in order to optimize the output of tiles, these factors need to be taken into account. Firstly, there's a vast difference in the foot pressure distribution during walking between young and old adults. The elderly above the age of 60 have lower maximum pressure and force as compared to younger, around the age of 20 to 40 years. Since pressure is a key element in maximizing energy input, it is important to consider factors that can increase or decrease the pressure. Further, the input energy can be increased if the tiles receive consistent pedestrian traffic. In fact, consistent traffic for a shorter duration generates twice as much energy as compared to an inconsistent pedestrian traffic for a longer duration. So installing these electric tiles on crowded walkways or dance floors will generate more energy as the traffic pattern is more consistent. Next, we have the shape of the piezoelectric tile that significantly affects the energy output. 
Halvagen is an established company using kinetic technology for, gen uh, for generating energy from footsteps. So they changed their tile shape from square to triangular because their square tiles, um, with their square tiles, only 20% would fall in the right place and trigger the generators. However, they reported 100% accuracy with triangular tiles. Additionally, the piezoelectric harvester can be coupled with other types of harvester to amplify the energy output. For instance, a piezoelectric thermoelectric hybrid energy harvester can collect energy from two different sources, um, such as thermal and kinetic, and by harvesting energy from two different sources at the same time, the total harvested energy increases. Lastly, the shape of the cantilever used within the tile can affect the output. So altering the shape of the cantilever may decrease the price per area of the piezoelectrics used within the tile, which would conceivably make the piezoelectric floor more accessible to lower income communities. Additionally, it has been empirically shown that certain shape alterations of the piezoelectric cantilever can use less than 60% of the mass, but have more than 40% power increase. And the image shows the most successful geometry in terms of voltage production. And we will further dive into this topic later on. So um, for power generation and storage, this, batch, uh, this project uses batteries known to be excellent for integration in um, renewable energy collection. As their energy transfer does not generate carbon emission, they are flexible in power and energy characteristics, they have long cycle lives, and are low maintenance, all of which align with the ideals of our project. And batteries have a primary use um, to support large-scale renewable energy storage because they stabilize and regulate frequency in order to interface with the system's output um, with the rest of the grid. So we mainly investigated two types of batteries, flow batteries and lead-acid batteries, and we found that vanadium redox flow batteries are considered useful for small-scale battery energy storage systems and have lower levelized costs of delivery. On the other hand, lead acid batteries score consistently for bulk energy storage, distributive storage, and power quality. Lastly, we looked into the environmental impacts of the batteries. And while batteries do not produce carbon dioxide directly through their use, they can have a variety of negative environmental impact, which in part depends on the type of battery used. And now we have Ian um, to present the methodology. Hello. So. I will talk a little bit about how we went about, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about our methodology for performing our experiment in order to characterize the um, effect of the shape of the cantilever on the shape of the wafer on the piezoelectric output. So here's the three research questions that our team used to guide our research and plan where we would go as we, where we would focus as we advance through the project. The third question is a particular note. As the literature review revealed an avenue of research, the output of the piezoelectric tile could potentially be affected by the shape of the wafer used. The team also wanted to make an effort to ensure we were improving and pursuing an optimized design. So we made sure to add both an uncut piezo and a linear tapered piezo to give our experiment a control, as well as attempt to validate the published results we found during our literature review. In order to begin testing and expanding our understanding of these topics, the team decided to construct an apparatus that would allow us to put a simple, consistent mechanical input onto a piezoelectric wafer and measure its response. The data could then be used to validate a mathematical model. This is the initial design of our testing apparatus. It is two parts, a piezoelectric wafer, shown here in yellow, and a plastic arm, the white component. The plastic arm was powered by a servo motor. As the arm is rotating, it contacts the wafer and deflects it. The motor is controlled by an Arduino, which is programmed to oscillate the arm back and forth, bending the wafer with consistent pressure and duration. Using an Arduino, the group could easily control the speed of the oscillations, which gave us a variable to control during testing. The piezoelectric was then connected to a simple circuit with a resistor, which was used to read the voltage drop induced by the, by the piezoelectric effect. This voltage was read by an oscilloscope and output to a CSV file, which could then be used for analysis. This design was a rapid prototype and had some notable issues. Most importantly was the material weakness. The, fastener was fastened at, the wafer was fastened down using an elect electrical tape, which worked over multiple trials and skewed our results. Additionally, this simulation was inaccurate to how we expected the piezoelectric to be treated in reality. The arm here oscillates back and forth, whereas in reality, the motion would be downward only. 
due to the fact that the piezoelectric was expected to be installed in floor tiles. Due to these issues, we had to improve upon this design. Here's our second iteration. It uses a rolling mass to displace the piezoelectric instead of an arm. This rolling mass is a cylinder with its center offset from the axis center, shown here. Okay. Um, as it was rotated, it would come into contact with the piezoelectric cantilever and, this, um, and then separate it as the rotation continued. This was much more in line with how we expected the piezoelectric to be treated in real life, as the roller would only simulate a downward force. The apparatus also fixed our materials issue, since it was composed of specially made 3D printed parts. A separate motor now, now controls the roller, which imparts a deflection of the piezoelectric, again highlighted in yellow. The readings were taken in the same way, with a resistor cir circuit and the oscilloscope probes placed across it. However, this design also incorporated a micrometer, which is mounted vertically and allows us to control the height of the rolling cylinder. Thus, in conjunction with our Arduino code, we had precise control over two variables to test for each design. I'll now, talk, I'll now pass the mic over to Liam so he can discuss more. Yes, uh, so now that we had our experimental test bed, we needed our different cantilever geometries to test on. Um, going off of prior research, which was uh, mentioned by Sanjali before, um, a paper called Pradesh et al. Um, uh, there exist certain shapes of piezoelectrics which demonstrate uh, that cantilevers with linear tapers offered a maximum of 45% peak voltage amplification over their rectangular unmodified counterparts. Um, using this literature, we had ascertained that it may be possible to further amplify a piezoelectric's performance by making its cantilever taper curved instead of a simple linear taper. Um, with this in mind, we designed several inverted cantilever tapers based on exponential, spherical, and sinusoidal curves. You can see here on the slide that um, the formula for the exponential curve that we use uh, projected onto the dimensions of the piezoelectric, uh, piezoelectric in Desmos and then converted into a CAD file. Um, we cut each of these curves into a pre-made piezoelectric transducer uh, cantilever from a uh, source from piezo.com in order to uh, keep our uh, performance constant across uh, each iteration. Um, these mathematical curves you can see here uh, were first ported to SOLIDWORKS and from there cut to shape by a water jet using equipment generously provided to us by our Terrapin Works and our mentor Rick Lanton. Thank you very much for that. Um, each of these three types of curves you will also notice were used twice uh, with convex and concave variants in order for us to fully investigate the breadth of possible curvatures um, which might pose, uh, which might provide some sort of amplification. Uh, in order to compare these curve profile performance with the baseline, we also tested an unmodified rectangular cantilever and a linear inverted taper, uh, which you can see here to the left. Um, the physical testing procedure for all of these cantilevers were to uh, attach it to a simple circuit with a 220 kilo ohm load to trivialize the cantilever's internal resistance and uh, give us a good resolution for the voltage produced. Um, and we measure the voltage across the resistor with an um, oscilloscope. Each cantilever here was tested under a range of displacement and frequency settings. You can see here the black box in the lower left side of the um, the lower left side of this image is our micrometer, which we used to change the displacement. And on the uh, top end of the photo, you can see the motor uh, connected to our Arduino, which we used to uh, change our frequency settings. Uh, each cantilever was text tested at a frequency of six hertz at displacements from zero to four millimeters and at a constant two millimeter displacement at frequencies from four to eight hertz. Uh, and for each of these combinations of settings, uh, five trials were collected over one second in order for us to make sure that our data was consistent. Uh, parallel to all of this work, we also attempted to model a piezoelectric cantilever's voltage output manually. Uh, using equations collected from the IEEE's publications on piezoelectrics and various other research papers which we had, we had collected along the way. Uh, unfortunately, while we could model the impulse of our test bed's camshaft, we were stymied in our modeling uh, thanks to several recurring errors which we were unable to resolve in time. Uh, you can see here on the bottom graph a uh, consistent error in the tailing end of each voltage impulse, which exponentially gets worse over time, which we were unable to resolve. Um, the simulation was eventually shelved in favor of analyzing data from the experimental curvatures, which were actually being tested around this time. Uh, so, 
Uh, in order to tackle all of these uh, tasks, we arrange ourselves into loose groups based on proficiencies and skills which would be best suited to each role. The construction team dealt with the programming and assembly of the test beds, as well as the operation of the water jet to manufacture our curved cantilevers. Uh, those test beds and cantilevers were then sent to the data collection team, which was responsible for running the experiments and processing the resulting data for analysis. That analyzed data was then sent to the modeling team, which, as the name suggests, uh, initially attempted to model our cantilever and later pivoted to analyzing the voltage output data and calculating the associated power and other metrics. Um, I will now hand it off to Michaela to actually tell you what those were. All right, hello. Now we move on to the results that we obtained. So the table above shows the whole and piezoelectric areas with each cantilever that we developed. The diagram on the right shows the whole area of the cantilever in blue compared to the area of the piezoelectric in yellow. For this diagram, the spherical convex cantilever is being used, and you can see exactly how much whole and piezoelectric area is present at the end of the cantilever. The graphs shown here represent the power outputs associated with the concave of that cantilever. This raw data gave us the voltage values and power associated with all the concave shaped cantilevers. The preliminary results from this data show that the highest power is achieved with the spherical and linear shapes with a rectangular being the uncut and baseline frequency. The graphs shown here represent the raw voltages and power outputs associated with the inverse or convex version of the cut cantilever shapes. The preliminary results from the convex shaped cantilevers indicate that the spherical and sinusoidal curves align very closely with their base, the rectangular uncut cantilever. In the first graph, the spherical and rectangular align so closely that the spherical curve is nestled behind both the rectangular and sinusoidal curves. In the second graph, we can see that the power values of the spherical and sinusoidal cantilevers seemingly outperform that of our baseline, the rectangular cantilever. And now we have Mark to discuss our analyses. Thank you. Once we had our data, we went to analyze it. So here you can see our analysis of the average peak power values among each of the piezoelectric geometries. We observed the relative peak values. And while most were observed to be lower than both of the control geometries of linear and rectangular, you can see that the concave spherical geometry has a higher power output than the linear. And both the convex spherical and the convex sinusoidal are a higher power output than the rectangular, including for the bottom graph here, which is the uh, which is the same figure but averaged by the piezoelectric area of each geometry. This implies that some factor of the geometry did lead to an increased output for these geometries. So here is our average power over one second for each of those geometries. So the top one is, again, the raw values, whereas the bottom one is the average per piezoelectric area. Uh, our results here are very similar to the peak power, which reinforces those results. However, unlike the previous one, where the convex spherical and the convex sinusoidal were about the same, here the convex spherical is clearly the highest, including for the average piezoelectric area. So here's, uh, these are the quantitative results for that previous graph. And you can see that the spherical convex geometry produced 24% more than the rectangular geometry, which means that there was definitely some boosting apparent. Uh, in general, you can see that exponential tapers performed very poorly compared to other tapers. And this actually uh, led us to believe that our particular exponential concave geometry may have been damaged, which would be something to look into in terms of further experimentation. And uh, among all geometries, it seems that concave cuts uh, performed consistently worse than their convex counterparts, even when the area was averaged. So next, we'll be going to Rithik to discuss more. All right, everyone, this will move into the discussion, and we'll begin this with a comparison to the existing literature, specifically the aforementioned article by E.L. Pradesh of the Benari Amman Institute. In Pradesh's uh, paper, he found that the uh, amplification of the inverse linear taper could be up to 45% more than the uncut rectangular piezo. However, our results find something contradictory. While he experienced an increase in 45% in peak voltage, we found a decrease in 50% in peak voltage. Uh, we believe this could be due to a couple of things. We have two hypotheses listed here, the first of which being due to manufacturing error. 
as was shown on previous tables, the concave exponential curve had a near neg had a negligible uh, peak power uh, peak voltage output, and we believe this may have been due to uh, manufacturing errors. And we believe that the same manufacturing errors could also be the reason why the linear inverted tapers vary so differently than the results of Pradesh. In addition, we had a different methodology than that of Pradesh, where we used our off-centered cylinder. Uh, Pradesh used a shaking mechanism to move the cantilever. Uh, despite this contradiction, we do find some agreement with Pradesh's findings in the fact that we had the two uh, curves, the convex spherical and the convex sinusoidal, that experienced uh, amplification in voltage when compared to the rectangular counterpart. And this leads us to future research potential. So we've only scratched the surface of our topic, and in our experimentation, we realize the potential for many more avenues of research. The first of which is to test more cantilever shapes. While we had narrowed our scope to uh, three types of curves, the exponential, spherical, and sinusoidal, we understand that there are more ge geometries to test that would have not been tested uh, before. Um, Due to our findings, we know that uh, convex cuts seem to perform better than their concave counterparts. So in our future research, we would like to look at new convex shapes. In addition, we would want to make sure that the manufacturing is not an issue like it had been in our current testing. So instead of using a subtractive manufacturing process, we would most likely try to find uh, custom piezos that we can test with. Another avenue of research is that of magnetic amplification. While we were never able to incorporate that into our research for uh, this project, we found in the literature review that there have been uh, there is evidence that magnets can be used to amplify the peak voltage of a piezoelectric cantilever. In fact, we had found that people who have made prototypes of piezoelectric quartiles have sometimes included magnets to perform an amplification. So what we would likely do is use this in tandem with curved cantilevers to see if there was any amplification to be found. The last uh, avenue of research to consider would be that of the full implementation of the floor tile. This was obviously our main goal when testing our curved uh, cantilevers, but there are many more factors that need to be looked into before we can fully implement the tile, some of which are listed on the screen now, which include energy lost to non-conservative forces, such as friction, uh, durability of both the piezoelectric cantilever and a floor tile that we would create, an analysis of foot patterns to know what, how would be the best manner of uh, funneling all of the Candle energy from foot steps into the cantilevers, and lastly, ADA compliance, uh, because uh, the ADA requires that floor tiles have a maximum amount of give, and just by nature of what we are making with our piezoelectric floor tile, there needs to be some give in it, so there is a balance to be struck. And that brings us to our final thoughts. To sum up, under a low-frequency environment, we tested eight different cantilevers, two controls in the form of the uncut rectangular piezo, and the linearly inverted taper to compare to that of Pradesh. In addition, we tested three curves, spherical, exponential, and sinusoidal in both concave and convex varieties. Our findings show that the convex varieties of both the spherical and sinusoidal curves was demonstrated an improvement upon our controls. In addition, we came across a few roadblocks due to manufacturing, and as such, we aim to verify results through more trials. However, our current findings seem to agree with the existing literature stating that tapered curvature can have a positive, positive amplifying effect. That brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you all so much for watching and being diligent. Uh, we would like to take this moment to uh, acknowledge our mentor, Rick, our librarian, Ivanko, the entirety of the Gemstone of Honors staff, both past and present, and all of our friends and family who have come out today and have supported us in the past. Thank you all so much. At this time, we will take the chance. All right. Thank you, Team Piso. We will open the floor for questions. Um, again, either out loud if you wish or via the chat feature. I think people are shy. Could I ask a quick question? Very simple. Early on, uh, uh, the first speaker said that there are, uh, I guess, uh, products or some research or some something related to piezo harvesters. But uh, uh, I forgot what the what the conclusion was. But my question is very simple. Are there any 
commercial uh, products that are using pesos uh, in the in the way that uh, you are thinking. Yes. Okay. Uh, piezoelectric energy harvesting exists as a concept uh, for a long time, but it is very often used in um, low power situations where you would expect to have some kind of consistent vibration. Um, it's al also very often used in sensors because, uh, of course, this same uh, phenomenon that produces voltage can also be used to uh, power some sort of uh, sensor signal. Um, but at present, the uh, concept has been investigated by several uh, review papers, but no um, commercial uh, no no commercial item exists uh, which exploits it in this way. Yes. So the the pathogen company that was mentioned in the literature review, they do have a, they are uh, power generating floor tiles, but they don't use specifically piezoelectrics in it. I think they use some, oh, yeah, magnetic energy by like deforming batteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th thank you. If I can ask like a more general question, uh, how much of an impact has this experience been on your collegiate experience so far? I would say a pretty significant amount as a, <laughs> as a three year project. It was um, it was definitely educational in the intricacies of like organizing a research project beyond just uh, creating, a, you know, collecting data and such. Um, as we were responsible for each element of uh, funding and sourcing um, and organizing and networking and such, um, it was a very edu educational experience in all those fields. Yeah, we were granted a lot of independence and a lot of authority in the work that we were doing. And I think it's safe to say that we're all very proud of the work that we've done since it truly is our own. I had a question for you that and I think it's probably a little bit semantic, but um... If you could go back to somewhere around slide, I don't know where it was, three or four, it was fairly early on in your explanation of just the piezoelectric phenomenon in the first place. Well, let's see. It was after that. Oh, this one, okay. So I think the phrase on this slide that um, bothered me a little bit was the phrase charge generation. Um, yeah. I think I know what you mean, but I also think that you don't mean charge generation. I think what you mean is that you are using work to move charge through an electric field into a configuration that it didn't otherwise want to be in. And in so doing, you have created a potential difference. Uh, yes, that is true. A uh, piezoelectric tile does not actually generate charge. It's a it's a current source. You deform it, and it moves charge. <laughs> well, um, which is not a that's not how you generate current. That's how you generate potential. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, it was a, a a slight typo on our part. Yeah, I don't. It, I wouldn't call it a typo. I'd call it a. Uh, it's you, what you're looking for. I, I get what you're trying to say. You're looking essentially for sort of a a colloquial way of connecting the mechanical force to the electrical um, uh, byproduct. So you know you're just you're 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 looking for the language that connects those two systems together, which which I get. I would just be a little bit more careful if I were you. If I may uh, chime in, I I I, uh, I think that this uh, charge generation might might be not exactly correct, but in some sense, 
it's probably a good interpretation of what's going on. Yeah. Because if you create, if you have a crystal and you simply create a voltage across it, well, that's the same thing as really creating charges here. At least ideally, that's really what happens is, or theoretically, you create a positive and negative charge. So I would not necessarily, uh, uh, it's not 100% accurate, but I don't really think it's wrong yeah. to say that. Of course, you'd have to explain it uh, like this all the time. So let, let me just uh, defend uh, the, the term uh, used by the group in, in, in this particular instance. Just to complicate things, I'm Please. not sure how, how much the group looked at things. This is Professor Lloyd. So I worked on PZT transducers for sonar many years ago when I did a um, sabbatical type uh, year at the Navy. But when you think about sort of the, the charge generation, you may not realize that the igniter, if you have a gas stove, is a piezoelectric. And so that's one thing. And I was I, I noticed you didn't really say a lot about things like sonar and fish finders, because those are actually probably uh, some of the biggest applications. Although Professor Cummings would say the inverse effect for moving samples around in his electron microscopes is incredibly important. <laughs> Um, so, and I don't, I, I have a lot more questions. I'm curious as to what your majors are. Okay. I guess we, we, can, go we can go through one by one. Uh, I'm Kayla, I'm majoring in mechanical engineering, and my degree is professor of medicine. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I don't think yeah, you can hear that. Hear that. Hi, I'm Kayla, I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm Liam, I'm majoring in physics. Uh, I'm Rithik. I'm majoring in both computer science and physics. Uh, I'm Ian. I'm majoring in mechanical engineering and architecture. I'm Mark. I'm majoring in electrical engineering. I'm essentially, I'm majoring in computer science. Okay. Those of you in mechanical engineering. We have one more. We have one more. Okay. I'm majoring in chemical engineering. Ah, excellent. Those of you majoring in mechanical engineering, have you taken ENME 382? Yes. Yes. Okay, we'll talk more later. <laughs> <laughs> and was that your favorite class in mechanical engineering? No, I, I just read some things in the introduction that I'm like, have they taken 382 if they're Mechies? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's required. The reason I'm asking that is I might have expected, you know, when you think about long-term use to have talked about concepts like fatigue, which is failure under cyclic loading, and clearly things like sonar arrays and the um, manipulators in Dr. Cummings' microscope are used for many, many, many cycles. Right. And they, and so, as I said, I have other questions that I'll ask in the closed, but so I think you did some really interesting things. I have some other questions. Uh, for the people in MECI or computer science, are you really good at CAD? I would have loved to have seen a cut uh, version of your testing apparatus so I could really see how the, the roller was deflecting the piezoelectric. And I would have loved to have had more detail on exactly what piezoelectric you were cutting. I don't remember you saying exactly, and I will apologize, but I've been really stressed, so I could only read fairly quickly. I couldn't read in great detail. No worries. Um, so we did actually, we, we weren't able to get a CAD model of the um, final testing apparatus together in the pod. So we bought the real thing. Um, let's see, there we go. <laughs> What's most to hold that while you demonstrate? All right. That's some, why don't you take the uh, take off your screen sharing, and then uh, we can probably see. Uh, yes. can, we can yeah. pin your camera and see that a little bit better. Uh, so you guys see this now a little more clearly. So all this making it full screen that works better. Okay, okay, now I can see it much better okay. because the way you presented it, I couldn't. So you're you are pressing it down. Okay, right. so this is the rolling, uh, the roller that we use. It's powered by a motor connected to this chain. And as it rolls, um, 
This is the piezoelectric weight curve at the bottom. It contacts the weight curve, deflects it uniformly, and then releases it. So and it does this through every cycle. Okay, um, so control the height using this micrometer. So we give have a very precise control over the amount of deflection. So your piezoelectric um, wafer. Yes. Commercial, right? Yes. Uh, do you know what it is? Um, we have the... In terms of the material? Yes. Is it a composite? Is it uh, the poly uh, vanilla? Uh, the PVDF? Is it PZT? Uh, it is PZT. Um, oh, it I is have... PZT. Okay. Yes. So here's a closer look at the um, rectangle. Okay. okay. So what care did you take when you were cutting it? Um, we so we uh, we cut it using water jet um, uh, with the uh, so we made sure that um, that we aligned our uh, we we aligned the you know rather small piezoelectric element with the um, corner bed of the uh, water jet cutter and uh, clamped it down. Uh, that. So can yeah. you show it? Can you can you make it big again and show me how much of that is PZT? Um, you can see the uh, there's a white a, a lighter square rectangle encased within the FR4 around the edge. Okay, so um, you I you have basically an electrode on top that's tan and it's the white. Okay. Yes, that's right. Um, we also included a diagram in our slideshow. So, so this is the um, the blue hash is the entire piece of electric after the cutting. The uh, yellow box here was the actual part. Oh, sorry, the blue hash is the entire thing. The yellow box is the piece of electric component um, before the cut. And then the uh, um, we were okay. showing. Sure Would the thickness of your wafer, other than affecting um, its ability to flex to some extent, be important for future studies? Uh, yes, we imagine so. Um, the thickness of the wafer is definitely a factor in the uh, stress and strain applied to the piezoelectric, um, which is a factor in its voltage output. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a pretty good bunch of uh, public questions. Thank you very much, everybody who uh, participated in that. What I'm going to do now, um, Dave, may I just quickly thank all of the members of the public audience for attending? Your your role in this process is really important too. So thank you for coming. It is, and I know the students are really happy that you came. It's really important to have friends and family supporting. Are you guys reading my I'm script? sure you're proud. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Maybe it's just presumed that I'm not a very polite guy, so I would forget that part anyway. No, we, we knew you would, but John and I are also both parents, as I think a number of other people here. So yeah. we're, go we're going to pile on what you would say. We're exactly, right. Well, I was going to start by saying, so this is the closing session of this year's thesis conference. So. Um, I, uh, I've, I've been listening to these things all day and it's really been great. Um, and um, uh, none less than, than Team Piso's presentation. So I think all of our senior teams have really done Gemstone Proud. Team Piso, you in particular have done Gemstone Proud. You had three years, um, of not always easy work, and you're you're still one of our you're still in one of the cohorts that had a big uh, COVID impact and all of these things. Um, so the fact that you were able to show up today and really give a, a, a tremendously articulate presentation and talk about some really important stuff that you had worked on, um, uh, I think, uh, is testament mostly to your own hard work and diligence 
um, and intellectual curiosity, which is just really great. Um, we look forward to seeing your final written thesis. I imagine that in your private discussion with your discussants, maybe there will be a few comments brought up there that um, can still be incorporated in your written thesis. So good luck with that. Um, Rick, you're the gatekeeper there. So when you're happy, we're happy. Um, so make sure that you have a soon after that, have a meeting with the team to talk about um, how, uh, how you want them to finish up. Will do. To all of the friends and family who joined us today, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we try very hard to make this uh, an event that's accessible to everyone. I know oftentimes we get buried in scientific jargon. Um, some of you are scientists who know more about this stuff than I do, and, and others, maybe some of this was a little bit uh, uh, strange to you, but uh, we're thrilled that you were here and that you came to support all of the members of Team Piso, and I'm sure they appreciate you being here. Um, we're uh, we're going to send Team Piso and their discussants and their um, mentor off to their private breakout. Um, for everybody else, thank you so much for joining us today, um, and I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. So, Team Piso, bear with me. I have to just sort of manually dump you over into your breakout room.